The first scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 26. Please listen to the word of God. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made in the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall ex execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will de dwell securely, and this is the name of by which will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that the day and the light will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on the throne and cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured. So I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying, the Lord has rejected the two clans that he chose. Thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus saith the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and fixed the order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not, will not choose one of the, his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortune and will have mercy on them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is also from the Old Testament, from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 22, found on page 208 in your pew Bibles, if you wish to follow along. Again, let us listen to the word of God. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malin and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. 
And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. We are beginning a new series today. Over these four Sundays of the season of Advent, we're going to look at the four chapters of the book of Ruth. Ruth is a wonderful little book tucked away in the Old Testament. It's one of only two books in the Bible named for a woman, and I believe it's the only book in the Old Testament named after a Gentile. This is part of the historical books in the Old Testament. It tells the the history of how this Gentile woman, Ruth, became an ancestor of King David, and then of ultimately of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the key to understanding the book of Ruth is this, and the reason we are studying it in this Advent season is kindness, radical, extraordinary kindness. The Hebrew word here is a special word, perhaps one of the most important words in the Bible. We've talked about it before. It's the Hebrew word chesed, and that's one of the things I love about Hebrew is it gets in the back of the throat, chesed. You have to say it like that. It makes it more fun. Chesed, it means kindness, but it means so much more. It also means love. It means grace. It means faithfulness. It means generosity. It means all of that and more wrapped up in one word. It's almost untranslatable from Hebrew into English. The best definition I heard comes from author and musician Michael Card, who said, chesed is when the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing at all, instead gives me everything. When I have a right to expect nothing, and yet I am given everything instead, that is the extravagant chesed kindness that we are talking about here. And it's this whole story is about that chesed, the chesed of Ruth, the chesed of her eventual husband, Boaz, the the chesed of her mother-in-law, Naomi, and ultimately behind all of this, the chesed of God. Because as we'll see, because of God's extravagant, radical, extraordinary kindness, Ruth will eventually have a child who will be the grandfather of King David, and because of God's continual kindness through David's line, our Savior Jesus is born. So the story begins here with a really big problem. Naomi and her family are not where they are supposed to be. 
The family is originally from Bethlehem, and yes, we're talking about that Bethlehem, the Bethlehem that will eventually be called the city of David, the Bethlehem that Joseph and Mary go to in order to give birth to baby Jesus. But we see here at the beginning of the story, the family has left Bethlehem. There is a famine there. And so Naomi's husband takes the family to the land of Moab, where they should not be. Moab is a Gentile land. The God that was worshipped in the land of Moab was a God worshipped through human sacrifice. They literally burnt their children on an altar in order to worship this God. And in the very recent past, because we're in the time of the judges, the king of Moab had conquered Israel for a time, had raided and harassed and oppressed and caused great trouble among the Israelites. So Moab is not a good place to be, and good things don't happen to God's people when they go to the land of Moab, and good things do not happen to Naomi and her family when they go there. First off, the head of the family... Naomi's husband, Elimelech, he dies in the land of Moab. And then their two sons, Malan and Chilion, marry Moabite wives, which throughout the Old Testament, it's almost always a problem when God's people marry outside of the faith, because by marrying foreign women, they often end up worshiping those foreign gods. That doesn't necessarily happen here in this story, but it was always a possibility. Then we find the next big problem. After 10 years in Moab, and by the way, surely, surely the famine in Bethlehem is over by now after those 10 years, but there's no movement to go back to the promised land. After 10 years, we find that Naomi's two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, neither have had any children. And that's a really big deal in this time frame. It's a bad sign. And then, after those 10 years, the absolute worst happens as both Malin and Chilean die as well. We're not told how, we're not told why, we're just told that they died. So now here's the situation. Naomi is now left in a foreign land where she does not belong. She has no man in her life, no husband, no son. Today, that would not be a particularly big deal necessarily, but in Naomi's day, that was a terrible situation to be in because society was structured in such a way that there was no job that a woman could have to provide for herself except for one, and that's the job you really didn't want. If you don't understand what I mean, ask me after the service. But it was a really big deal for there not to be a man in the family to provide and protect the women. So Naomi and her two daughters-in-law are left here destitute and defenseless and alone, all the result of a very bad decision made by Naomi's husband years and years before. Does that sound familiar to you? Whenever I read the book of Ruth, I always identify a little bit with Naomi. Poor, poor old Naomi. Naomi, I think, represents all of us in this particular story, especially in this season of Advent. To borrow a phrase from the prophet Isaiah, Naomi is the people walking in darkness who are in need of a great light. Naomi represents the people who are hurting, the people who are living with the 
painful consequences of their actions, the consequences of their sins, and the consequences of the sins of others that are still affecting their own lives. Naomi represents the people who need help, and there doesn't seem to be any help in sight. The people who are left bereft and helpless and alone and very possibly bitter because of their lot in life. In fact, Naomi even changes her name at this point. The name Naomi means pleasant and happy. She says, don't call me pleasant anymore. Don't call me happy anymore. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. She says, there's no happiness left for me. There's no pleasant things left for me in my life. So don't call me that. I've been bitterly dealt with by God. God is against me, Naomi says. The Lord has brought calamity down upon me because I went where I was not supposed to go and I did what I was not supposed to do and now I'm dealing with the death and the pain and the grief and she needs a savior. Again, I asked, does this sound familiar? Naomi's story is our story, isn't it? And thankfully, this isn't the end of that particular story, because as we will see, by the time we get to Ruth chapter 4, Naomi is going to say, call me Naomi again. This is the story, at least partly, of how Naomi becomes happy again. How her life, which was once empty, becomes filled again, and it's all because of the chesed of God. Here's the good news for us. Even while Naomi feels that God is turned against her, even while Naomi feels that God has dealt bitterly with her, even as Naomi feels that she, her life has been emptied of all the good things, has been emptied of all the blessings and the pleasantness and the happiness, nevertheless, God is still at work behind the scenes. She may not see it, she may not understand what God is doing, she may not feel it, but God is still at work through his chesed to bless and fill Naomi's life again. And the first way we see God's extraordinary kindness to Naomi is through the extraordinary kindness and love of Ruth her daughter-in-law. This is quite often how God blesses us. He blesses us through the people in our lives. Naomi finally decides it's time to go back to Bethlehem. The famine is long over. Naomi has no reason to stay in Moab anymore and nothing to lose by going home. I will point out a significant detail when she gets there. There are all the people who stayed in Bethlehem and they're still doing fine. God took care of them during the famine, all her friends and family members. It's an important detail. But before she sets off, to come home, she tries to say goodbye to her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. She releases them from their tie to her because underneath that hard shell of bitterness that has developed on Naomi, there's still underneath a very kind woman who recognizes, I have nothing to give these women in my lives. I have no husband to give them anymore who will provide for them and protect them and take care of them. If they stay with me, all that they have to look forward to is poverty and danger and very likely bad things happening to them. And she hints that she's past menopause at this point, so there's no more sons coming. And even if she weren't, she says, even if I could get married and have a son today, it's ridiculous to ask you to wait around for that child to grow up so that you can marry him. So I have nothing to give you. And she sends her daughters-in-law or tries to send them back to their own families so they could marry again and possibly have some happiness in their life. 
But at the beginning, both Ruth and Orpah want to stay. They love Naomi. That tells you something about her right there. Finally, common sense prevails in Orpah, and she kisses Naomi and goes back to her family. But in contrast to that, Ruth stays. Naomi has nothing to give her. And yet, in her extraordinary chesed, in her extraordinary kindness and generosity and grace and love, Ruth stays. She says, don't urge me to leave you. Don't urge me to return back home. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do so to me, and also much more, if anything but death parts me from you. Folks, that is remarkable. That is a remarkable thing to say. That is an incredible declaration of loyalty and kindness and love and faithfulness. And it's extraordinary to find that level of commitment and faithfulness in love in any relationship, but especially from a daughter-in-law. I'm not married, but I'm told in-laws can sometimes be a little, little bit of a problem. From a daughter-in-law who comes from a people who are naturally an enemy to Naomi's people, to find this level of commitment and loyalty and kindness and grace is remarkable. And it's through this bond that God is going to turn Mara back into Naomi again. And it's through this bond, through this faithfulness and kindness, and through the faithfulness and kindness of so many others down through the centuries that God provides a Savior for us so that we can be transformed from the people who walk in darkness to the people who see a great light. Because here again, here's the point of all of this, whether we see it or not, God is at work right now among us. God is at work in our lives. God is at work in our world. God is at work through his chesed, through his extraordinary kindness, keeping the promises that he made to us centuries ago. Promises to transform and rebuild and remake our broken, fallen, sinful world. Tra promises to make all things new. Promises to heal all that has been stolen and broken and destroyed. It doesn't matter how badly we have screwed up our lives. It doesn't matter how bereft or dry we feel because of bad choices we made years ago or bad choices that other people made that we're still living with and dealing with after all these years. It doesn't matter that we're people walking in the darkness of sin, in the darkness of rebellion, in the darkness of death. The good news is our God is still an extraordinarily kind God, a God of chesed, a God who cares for us even when we have wandered away and gone where we were not supposed to go and done what we were not supposed to do. And God says through Jeremiah, if you can break the covenant with the day and the covenant with the night so that day and night will not come at their appointed times, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he would not have a son to reign on his throne and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers." That's a promise that God gave at least 700 years after the time of Ruth and Naomi. We still find him centuries later, a God of chesed and faithfulness and goodness, a God who keeps his promises. And he says here in his extravagant kindness and love that he will no more abandon us to our sins than he would give up on the idea of day and night the very first thing that God created. He said, let there be light separating the day and the night. 
He said he will no more abandon his promise to give us a great king and a great priest who will be our Savior and our Lord. There's a better chance that the sun will not come up when it's supposed to tomorrow than that God would abandon us to our brokenness and our sins. God promised Jeremiah a Savior was going to come, and what are we celebrating here this season? A Savior has come, and He's coming again. He promised that He would continue the work that He began centuries before, work that we are seeing here in our story playing out in the lives of Naomi and Ruth, Ruth who went on to become the great-grandmother of King David, who is one of the ancestors of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, down through the ages, God has refused over and over and over again to give up on His people even when we chose to walk in darkness. He promised us a great light, and in His kindness, that light has come to us in Jesus Christ, and that great light still shines today. So if you come here feeling a little battered, a little bruised, are you hurting today? Are you hurting because of Maybe some choices that you made years ago that you still have to live with or choices that other people made that have made your life what it is? Do you feel like all the happy has gone out of your life and only the bitterness remains? Or have you ever felt that way? Do you know what that feels like? You may not be going through it now, but you've been there and you know what that is like. If that describes any of us here, here's the good news for us. God is still with us and God is still for us. We may not feel it. We may not feel it today or tomorrow or the day after. But God has provided rescue for people like you and me. It doesn't matter what our experience is. This is the truth. This is what is going on, whether we can see it or not. God still wants to be a part of our lives. And just think of all the work that He has done down through the centuries for us. That is His chesed, His extraordinary kindness. And over the next few weeks, we're going to see how that plays out in the life of Ruth and the life of Naomi. But for today, here's what I want us to take with us. Wherever we go, God goes. Wherever we stay, God stays. We are His people. He is our God, always, even if we have made a complete mess of our lives. Even if we have brought death and pain down upon ourselves and upon others. Even if we feel that we are at the end of our tether. Folks, here's the good news. When you feel like you're at the end of your tether, God's at the other end. You are always tethered to God whether you feel it or not. And it's more likely that God is going to give up on day and night itself than that He's going to give up on us. He's a God of chesed, a God of extraordinary kindness. And down through the ages, He has been at work over and over and over again to give us a Savior, and that Savior is His own Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we're celebrating in this Advent season. This is what this season is all about, a season of extraordinary kindness The extraordinary kindness of our God shown to us in a baby, in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your kindness, for your grace for your faithfulness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you have stuck with us and have been a God who has kept his promises even when we wandered away from you. Help us, Lord, in this Advent season to remember and to 
to take joy in your extraordinary kindness and love for us and help us to show that kindness and that love to others. In Jesus' name, amen.